How's that? Can you see what you expect to see? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to chat with you today. So um, I, I sort of debated a few different projects to talk about um, and um, landed on some stuff. But um, like, uh, uh, like Professor Levin said, I'm always happy to talk, um, talk about collective behavior and um, I'm nearby. Um, and uh, also, yeah, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Um, we, this can be just more of a conversation. Um, uh, I realized just, you know, a minute ago that perhaps I should tell you a little bit about who I am and my background. Um, so I did my PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, where I studied collective ant behavior. And I did a postdoc kind of uh, spread out at a few locations. So at Michigan State University um, and at, uh, at Harvard in uh, Radhika Nagpal's group, if you might know some of her work. She's a computer scientist um, doing collective behavior, but with uh, sort of bio-inspired robotics, especially. Um, but I was still studying uh, studying animals, <laughs> studying ants there, and doing and doing modeling and um, theory stuff. So I I did not myself um, delve very far into the realm of of robotics, but it was really great to um, to do that really interdisciplinary work and um, spend time with with folks who think about these questions pretty differently. Um, yeah, uh, and then yeah, I landed. Uh, oh, and I also Albert Cow is a new uh, new collective behavior professor at UMass Boston. So I spent some time. Um, yeah, I had collaborated with him for a while. Spent some time in his group as well. So um, and he is brand new there. So also an interesting person to chat with if you're interested. Who's local? Um, all right. So today I thought I'd focus on problem solving and dynamic control in self organized systems. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I, my work is broadly motivated by wanting to understand how complexity and patterns and even intelligence emerge from groups of simple individuals. Um, and I think this group, group is really familiar with, um, with this, but across all scales, we know that collectives are capable of accomplishing tasks that are a lot more complicated or a lot more difficult than what the individuals in those groups can, um, can accomplish. And in a lot of cases, groups are groups also can outperform so-called intelligent intelligent individuals um, like individual people. And this is perhaps surprising because we might expect collective systems. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what the. I don't know. What, OK, my keyboard's not working, but that's OK. Um, we might expect co uh, collective systems to face particular control challenges because they have to integrate all of their sensing, decision making and actions across dispersed individuals that might be physically separated by a lot of space, might be only loosely connected. So how can decentralized systems coordinate? Um, so I just want to expand on this for a moment and think about a spectrum be between distributed systems that have no leader, like these ants here, um, and systems with really centralized processing where you have a single entity gathering information and making decisions. We already know that there are a bunch of benefits to being over on the distributed end of the spectrum. So we know that just decentralized groups are really robust um, and they also often make better, more rational decisions than individuals. But there are also costs to distributed processing. So um, we at least imagine that centralized approaches might be faster and more nimble in the sense that they can respond more to changes or to new information. So I sort of think about this as distributed systems having high inertia. And the potential cost of high inertia is going to matter more in some groups and for some tasks than others. So tasks that require a lot of flexibility um, because they're being performed in conditions that are constantly changing or tasks that require a lot of trial and error. I think it's reasonable to expect. Oh, sorry, got ahead of myself here. I think it's reasonable to expect that uh, those kinds of tasks might be particularly challenging for distributed groups. Um, <clears throat> so um, I I. Um, so I, I have a few tasks kind of focus, a few projects that I have focused on each of these kinds of tasks. Um, I was going to say that I'll talk about each of these, but I actually decided this morning to, to focus a little bit less on the dynamic control of self-assembled bridges and a bit more on the trial and error tasks. So I'm happy to tell you about this um, this bridge, uh, self-assembled bridge project um, in Army Ants that I uh, finished more recently. Um, but like I said, I'm going to focus today on collective problem solving during obstacle navigation. Um, oh, okay. So 
I first explored this collective obstacle navigation problem in the context of cooperative transport, uh, which is what I what I studied for my PhD. So um, this is an example of cooperative transport. This is a group of paratri paratrichina longicornis ants. Um, the common name for this ant species is longhorn crazy ants. So um, I'll probably just refer to them as crazy ants. And they're working together here to carry this large dead cricket. Um, and you can see they're good at this. They're moving really quickly um, or relatively quickly. Um, they are not stopping and starting all the time. Um, so these particular ants, this ant species is really good at cooperative transport, but just for some context, most ant species are really not very good at this at all. So um, most species, if, even, if they even try to work together to carry something, um, they'll pull in opposite directions, perhaps for a long time. Um, they'll stop and start a lot. Um, but I studied the crazy ants. Um, I did I did actually do some comparative work about the differences maybe between groups that are um, species that are good and species that are not so good. Um, but I'm just going to talk about the crazy ants today. Um, so let's take a look at the whole process of cooperative transport. The first thing that usually happens um, when when we see cooperative transport is that an ant that happens to be foraging comes across a large food resource and decides that um, she can't carry it herself. She needs help. She'll then typically return to her nest to recruit more workers. Oh, I apologize for that. Um, she'll re re recruit more workers. And once there are enough ants around the object that they're able to move it, um, they need to make a collective decision about which way to go. Um, and this direction that they pick, though, is not going to work for the whole journey back to their nest uh, because they're going to run into things like obstacles, um, like twigs, like leaves, or like this rock here. Really, anything is an obstacle when you're the scale of an ant. And to navigate around these obstacles, they have to make a whole series of new decisions. If they can do that, though, they're likely to make it all the way back to their nest. Um, so during my PhD, I spent a lot of time researching the mechanisms of this initial part of the process on how groups make a collective decision in the first place. Um, so I studied the individual traits and behaviors that promote kind of a group group level success, why some species are better than, than others, as I mentioned. Um, but today I'm really just going to tell you about the part of my uh, PhD work that was on obstacle navigation, um, because like I said, this is a task that requires trial and error. <clears throat> Um, so I, I want to convince you that um, obstacle navigation requires problem solving. It requires a whole series of decisions that build on one another. Um, because the, like I said, the first direction, you know, they, they might choose to turn initially when they hit an obstacle, they might choose to turn left, um, but then they have to choose when to turn back towards their goal or perhaps turning left in the first place doesn't actually work. Maybe it's a really complex obstacle. Maybe they have to move backwards in, it, in order to, um, to get around it. Um, so they have to sort of, they may have to try multiple directions um, and what the kind of optimal choice at any given moment might depend on the decisions that they, they just made. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about um, potential strategies for navigating around obstacles. Um, I was really interested particularly in a, whether a strategy um, or, or yeah, is simple versus robust. So, so um, strategies that might be really easy for uh, um, ants to accomplish um, may work well for some obstacles, but there may be obstacles that you need a much more robust strategy for. So let's just talk about an example here. Let's say um, we have this simple, simple obstacle here, a simple wall. Um, and the uh, let's imagine that the ants strategy for navigating around obstacles is that when they hit an obstacle, um, they they choose the direction to move. And then as soon as the the path, as soon as the direction of their goal becomes available again, they switch and move directly in that direction. Um, so that would work really well for this obstacle here. And um, I say this is a simple strategy in large part because we, we might expect ants to be particularly good at this kind of strategy. The only information you need to know to do this is the direction of, of your goal. Um, and ants are, are really good at knowing the direction of their nest, or they tend to be. Um, so you don't actually need any other information to succeed here. And if the ants were following that strategy, they would succeed with this obstacle um, without, without any issues. But of course, we can imagine more complex obstacles, um, as I as I mentioned, where this strategy would fail. Um, so here, because the ants have to move backwards to escape this obstacle, you know, the direction of their goal is physically going to be unblocked well before they have escaped. As soon as they start to move backwards, 
you might imagine they they could say oh the direction of the nest is free again i'm going to move in that direction before they've even gotten out of the obstacle um and we can imagine other strategies of course that would work for this kind of obstacle too but they all require having more information or more complex processing than the simpler strategy so um this if for example if their strategy if they are keeping track not only of the direction of their nest but also of how close they are to their nest at every moment um using both of those pieces of information has been shown to uh be able to solve any any um any obstacle at all but uh does of course require more information um i just want to take like say a side note which is that um the kind of uh uh this this project was inspired in part by um by known simple obstacle navigation strategies for um from the field of robotics um so this was a collaboration with radhika nagpal um and and sort of these kind of endpoints these these sorts of um uh endpoints of the spectrum from simple to robust were was coming from this uh robot navigation literature can i ask okay. a tangential question yeah please yeah uh, so um you said that the task on the left hand side of the screen is relatively simple but even within that you would need all the aunt ants to sort of come to a consensus oh yeah in terms of so so there must be some kind of a communication or all, all that stuff so it's not as simple as it might seem right yes, that's, that's absolutely right and that's um i think it, so so the the question that i spent um most of my phd really working on is how might they come to a consensus in the first place um and i uh, for various reasons it's kind of experimentally a lot more challenging to study that question um while they're already moving than for the first decision they make so i focused when in terms of the actual mechanisms of coordination um i focused a bit more on the first decision they make to go from you know not moving at all to moving um but change the the decision to change directions um i think a lot of similar processes are likely involved but um it's a little bit more experimentally difficult so um i have less in terms of like the behavioral mechanisms i have a like perhaps less satisfying answers for that but i'll show you some examples of of them you know maintaining consensus um and that's uh to make a long story short i think um uh they're they're feeling kind of voting by feeling the forces through the objects they're carrying right so they're physically tethered together if if one pulls strongly the others will feel it um and uh especially on a simpler you know uh, if if the object they're carrying is relatively simple um and not doesn't have like moving pieces although it often does. Um, but and then I think individual persistence is a big part of it. So um, persistence or stubbornness, if you have, I did some theoretical work as well, um, and some some comparative work across species that if individuals, uh, the kind of more persistent individuals are about their direction, um, even the more stubborn they are, surprisingly, that improves coordination, they're able to coordinate mm -hmm. better. I was initially expecting the opposite. But I think that um, the problem of like nobody has a strong opinion is harder in the in the in the case of the um you know at least in the ants that I was looking at um that's a harder problem than the problem of like two individuals are pulling in opposite directions so um that was maybe a bit rambly but yes I agree that the the problem on the left is by no means simple but with respect to the obstacle itself the challenge of that problem isn't so much the shape of the obstacle is just the fact that they they have to maintain consensus so um yeah maybe that does that speak, get to your question about yes absolutely thank you so much okay. cool yeah um okay great so like i said uh part of this work was inspired by the robot navigation literature um and i just wanted to know we wanted to know you know how how are ants going to do at these at these really different kinds of obstacles um you know so if they're following a really simple obstacle uh, obstacle navigation strategy a strategy that we expect to be really easy for ants where they they only need to know the direction of the goal um we would expect them to do really well at the obstacle on the left and perhaps completely fail to navigate the obstacle on the right um and if they are using an extremely robust strategy uh then we would expect them to be perform relatively equally well with with these um these obstacles so i uh i went to the field to to do um to study 
studied this in Arizona. This is my field assistant, Zach um, Dix. And we uh, we gave ants, groups of crazy ants, little pieces of tuna to carry. We blocked their paths with obstacles that look like this, um, as well as an impossible <laughs> obstacle to see how they, um, how they handle that. And of course, we recorded them doing it many times. Um, so here's one of the videos. Um, and one of the things I want you to pay attention to uh, is what we were just talking about, how rapidly they change direction when they do. I was really surprised. I thought when they first hit this obstacle, they would kind of stop and have to regroup. Um, but even, you know, even when they don't know where to go, they, it's clear that they don't, they don't, you know, they change direction several times. It's not like they, there's no trail here already formed. Um, I, I didn't put the obstacle down until they were almost there. So I, I knew that, but it's not like they know where to go. They don't, but they are, are not, it doesn't, it takes them like, you know, a moment or like a second or less to, to change direction. Um, so Justin, they are really amazing at maintaining consensus, which I looked at quantitatively as well. Um, but that was one of the take home messages that these these crazy ants are really good at maintaining consensus. And I think that that's one of the primary things that distinguishes them from the species that uh, that don't do cooperative transport well, which makes a lot of sense. Um, OK, so once I had recordings of all of these um, obstacle navigation events, I extracted from those recordings the um, trajectory of the piece of tuna. So this is just looking at the group level trajectory. Um, I have some other um, you know, work and thoughts uh, about individual uh, movements and individual contributions to this. Um, but but these images are just the trajectory of the whole group. Um, and you can see that they do navigate around these simpler obstacles pretty effectively. You know, as as you saw in the video example, um, they do change their minds, they do change direction, um, but they were able to navigate around all of these pretty rapidly. Um, and they also have, however, succeeded at navigating around all of the more challenging obstacles. Um, not so easily, you know, so it took them significantly longer. They had significantly um, more circuitous paths. Um, you know, they spent a lot more time um, navigating around these more challenging obstacles. But I was actually surprised initially that they succeeded at all. Um, it never took them longer than about 10 minutes to escape these harder obstacles, even though they have to move backwards away from their goal to do it. So I wanted to look more carefully at how, how are they escaping those obstacles. Um, just to show you a video ex example of that first. This is obviously sped up dramatically, and now it's speeding up even more. Um, and you can see that they do, in fact, have a strong bias towards moving in the goal in the direction of their goal. You know, they every time they move away, they're very likely to turn back towards their goal. But they do eventually um, manage to completely escape the obstacle um, and move on. So let's take a closer look at one of these trajectories. I'm focusing just on one particular trial. Um, so you might notice that when they first hit the obstacle, which is the pink part of the line, um, they spend most of their time along this back wall, which is as close to their nest as they can get. And it's not until later on, the bluer part of the line, that they seem to explore the space more. So this made me wonder, do they actually, are they, are they more likely to move further backwards the longer they've been stuck in an obstacle? Um, so to find out, I extracted the distances of all of the backwards movements from all of their trajectories, um, where a back, uh, I, I counted it as a single backwards movement for as long as they were moving away from that wall. And as soon as they the distance to that back wall started decreasing again, that was the end of that backwards movement. Um, <clears throat> OK, um, so, yeah, and then, that, then I just asked, do those distances of backwards movements change in time? Um, so here are the here are density plots showing the distributions of the distances of backwards movements um, for uh, for these trials where I've broken these different lines are showing different time intervals. I've broken the trials up into different chunks of time. Um, so if you look at just the the very first time interval when they first hit these obstacles, almost all of their backwards movements are very, very short. They're essentially bouncing around along the back wall. Um, but then by the last few time intervals, they're much more likely to move substantial distances backwards. Um, and, you know, I, I excluded the, the final um, backwards movement that led to their escape from all of my analyses um, and confirmed statistically that, yes, the mass of this distribution is shifting more towards the right the longer they're stuck. So the longer they're stuck in these obstacles, the further backwards they move. Um, 
Yeah, so go ahead. Can I ask a very quick question? Yeah. Um, yeah. From the videos that we're seeing, um, do the other ants also interact with the ants that are carrying the load? Are they also reporting what the environment looks like and what the that's best really, trajectory is? That's a really great question. And I've spent quite a bit of time on that question. Or I've spent time, quite a bit of time thinking about that question. Um, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, so those are referred to as escort ants. Um, and they they do seem to play an important role. And there's another group um, who has done quite a bit of obstacle navigation work on this species, um, the Feynman group, Alfred Feynman's group at, um, oh, I'm blanking. Um, I wanna say Hertzberg, but anyway, um, they have, they, they, they found um, in the population they're studying that yes, those escort ants joining, um, if they, if they join uh, the transport group, they have an outsized influence on the on the direction. Um, and I think that is likely to be important in some contexts. Um, they also have found that that they and and I I can confirm that the these other ants that are around are sometimes laying some pheromone trail. Um, it's it's really conspicuous when these ants lay pheromone and and that's sort of happening um or in the vicinity of this um uh of the cooperative transport group uh pretty frequently even after they're they're moving um so that could be another additional source of information um i i noticed though i i i tried to sort of do a pretty careful analysis of this um you know initially qualitatively but the that's not happening very much while um while they're in the this hard obstacle though i i'm not seeing um that kind of information while they're navigating around this this challenging obstacle or obstacles in general um so that doesn't mean that they're not providing information but i will say kind of i think they are i don't think they're required however because um sort of try you know there's there's a lot of variation in how many of those there are around um and trials where there were few if any um it didn't seem like they were substantially worse at navigating around obstacles than when there were many I also see actually fairly low turnover. Um, so in terms of the possibility of ants joining and 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 um, providing you information, I think that absolutely happens. But but even when you know there there isn't as much turnover as you might expect in in my in my pro in this project anyway. When um, if if that if that was really crucial information, you would expect more turnover. Um, and and I also looked really carefully at the specific um, the specific turns that led to their success when you know the 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 last turn they made that allowed them to escape, um, and some of those did coincide with another ant joining, um, but but the majority of those there was nothing that I could see. Obviously, I'm not an ant. <laughs> There's nothing I could see though that that kind of directed that. Um, so yeah, long story short. Absolutely, the other ants are playing a role. Um, in fact, I, I mentioned in passing that I also gave them an impossible obstacle, which was um, it was just this same obstacle here, but with the door shut. Um, and their behavior in that shocked me because um, they, I expected it to look pretty similar, their trajectories to look maybe pretty similar to um, to this 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 obstacle here. Uh, and maybe eventually they would kind of give up, but they almost immediately start to give up. Um, it's like they know very, very quickly it, um, that something is different. And so I think what explanation for that might be that in the case where this door is shut, um, the escort ants, these extra ants around, there's there's maybe fewer of them, they're not changing over. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but I, I wanna say, I think they're really important. Um, I don't think they are, absolutely necessary especially not for obstacle navigation and um and i don't know more about their importance really <laughs> uh, yeah. so, sorry uh, is it possible to track uh pheromone trails laid by uh escort ants is it any method or technique yeah so actually that's something that the fireman group has has done so um i you know and i i could quibble a bit with some of the ways they're doing it and i i would be i'm would be fascinated to apply that method to um my videos which i i think the trick there is that in order to do that they had to be um they had a moving camera that was focused on the object so they could be really close which is hard to couple certainly not impossible but hard to couple with 
needing a wider view for obstacle navigation. So um, yeah, I think, uh, so that has been done. It has not been done in the context, I don't think in the context of obstacle navigation, but um, but yeah, it's a very, because it, it's tricky because um, the only thing you can see, you can't, you can't chemically track um, as far as I know. Um, you can't sort of pick it up, but you can, uh, they have this halting movement pattern when they're laying pheromone trail where they, they pause every centimeter or so just for a fraction split second to um, touch their gaster down to the ground to lay that pheromone trail. So, um, so you can kind of see it in, in a video. Um, and that is, that's what the, what the Feynman group used to, um, get that automatic kind of information. Um, so yes, to some extent you can. Helen, if, yeah. if you compare these behaviors, uh, so these rules that you're sort of sussing out about how these navigate different environments, how does that compare to if you had the same species, but a solitary individual carrying a single piece of cargo, are they yeah. scaling up the rules of the individual or is it a completely different strategy? I don't, I don't think they're scaling up the rules of the individual. Um, oh man, you, you're all asking such great questions, which is not surprising. And it's also just reminding me of all of my like zombie data projects that I haven't done because I, I, um, so I, I collected videos of individual ants, uh, facing these same obstacles with itty bitty pieces of tuna um and also with uh you know like using like liquid um liquid bait um where their behavior is actually kind of different but um the these ants the the challenge is um it was really yeah so this was this was i you know actually if i if i did turn back to it i might be better equipped now but the challenge is the there's a real computer vision challenge in um tracking these individuals because they move absurdly quickly and in very very like they're called crazy ants because they have this really crazy movement pattern they kind of like jolt all over the place and it's, it's quite unpredictable um and i think it's fine for tracking at close up um but the videos that i have which are not that close they're they're similar to this because of the scale of the obstacle uh, just made it challenging to track the individuals. So um, even 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 manually, even you know, just with by eye, um, not impossible, but it it never happened. It hasn't happened. It could happen in the future still. But um, but my intuition, however, from having just you know not quantitatively analyzed it at all, but having actually just done that experiment, is that it's very different. The individuals. Um, they 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 often would run up to the obstacle and just um just bounce back and forth like a lot they're they're moving so fast um i think the i think that my impression is that the additional um effort of like having a really circuitous path and and going far more distance than you need to is just like not important at the scale of the individual um when the ob when the object is small enough that you know they don't it, the F, there's not like a huge amount of effort to actually move it in the first place. So um, I do think it's a wholly different set of rules. Can right. I ask a quick question as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, so from your videos, it's it, these are these are really cool. Um, but there are two ways that they could solve this problem, right? Is that just bounce around all along the wall and then accidentally discover, oh, there is a hole here through which we can escape. Or after doing some whatever uh, information gathering, they can mm -hmm. know, okay, here's the hole, let's go for it. And it looks from the video is that it's like, like the latter because it's like they are struggling, struggling, and then suddenly they get it and they, they just go through that gap even without touching the, the corners or, or anything like that. Is, does that make any sense? Yeah. Or, well, or is it, that... it does make sense. I, I guess I will say you, you saw one video, which uh, I, you know, I, I could look back through um i don't think it was as clean in all of the videos um i think that uh but there i think that it is true that maybe and maybe this speaks maybe this gets at what you're saying i hadn't thought about specifically how they're interacting with the exit but it is true that across the board once they do exit they immediately turn around and know where to go and that is still very surprising to me yeah um so yeah, there's something potentially interesting going on there, um, and that might that might be affecting the exit itself as well. And mm -hmm. even if it maybe it's something that you know, they they don't they don't appear to be exploring the space enough 
to like build a map. They, you know, yeah. there were there were plenty of examples where they escaped a lot faster, although that certainly might have been random. Um, what isn't happening, I don't think, at least not um by a rule, at least not that the majority of the time is that in individuals are leaving and exploring to see where the exit is and then coming back. I, I looked for that and didn't find that um to be a common thing that was happening. But um yeah, I mean you're right that so so what I what I know so far is is pretty basic in terms of um I can compare their performance with what we would expect with some kind of really gross ideas about their what their strategy could be but um there are pieces to the strategy that uh I certainly you know I don't I don't pretend to know what the strategy is um it's very cool though yeah 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 thanks um they're also you know side note normally would be the option of just climbing they can they can lift these things and go vertical too so normally they'd also be able to climb the walls which I've prevented by just making them really slippery um so and maybe that's affecting things maybe they're just trying that over and over, although they don't, they certainly don't seem to be. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll kind of recap this, um, this, what I've told you about this project, which is just sort of scratching the surface a bit. Um, what I learned about their collective strategy, which again, as we just talked about is, is I don't know what it is, but I know that it involves sticking together. So they are um, extremely good at maintaining consensus, even when they do not know where to go. Um, so they stick together, they maintain consensus. Uh, they are also flexible. So, you know, they they don't, even though they start off with this tendency to want to move as the way I'm interpreting it, the, this tendency to, you know, have this strong bias to moving towards their their nest, um, which is the easy thing, right? We they uh we they are good at knowing the direction of their nest. That should be an easy strategy for them to use. Um, they will shift over time to a more complex strategy, one that is more robust um, over time if that initial strategy doesn't work. Um, so that's that's what I did with cooperative transport, with obstacle navigation in the context of cooperative transport. But cooperative transport, working together to carry something heavy, that's unusual. Um, that's not normally how groups move through the world. And it's actually, as uh, basically, we think just ants really um and humans um and, and maybe a couple other species but mostly just ants and humans that even do that at all um and you know most most groups that are moving through the world including groups that are very invested in, in sticking together are not tethered together right by the objects that they're carrying in the case of cooperative transport so i i really wanted to explore how these more typical groups navigate around obstacles um and i i just have done one project looking at this in theory um i think there's potential for a lot a lot more interesting stuff um here but i just thought i'd share a little bit about what i've learned um with this this little theory project um so so a bit more motivation and context for this um so we there's been a a lot of really great work on flocking models on on um modeling swarm movement um it's one of the really well studied behaviors in collective behavior um going back decades um you know we know that quite simple individual rules uh can reproduce um behavior that that appears very similar um to what swarms do what swarms of schools of fish uh you know flocks of birds things like that but those um kind of standard uh well studied flocking models typically exclude obstacles um when in real life in the in in nature animals that are moving through the world are going to be facing obstacles very frequently so how do you so so with um with some collaborators justin werfel stefan pop and varun joshi uh we wanted to explore how does those, those those basic flocking models i say basic they're not they're not basic but those existing flocking models that are well studied how do they behave when we just throw some obstacles at them um so this was you know really inspired by the project i showed with i showed you as i mentioned already um but we we wanted to kind of apply that concept again to these flocking models so uh we started with these well studied models where um they they have zones of avoidance alignment and attraction um so you know you have some individuals they have behavioral rules um this uh kind of ian cousins was one of the persons one of the people um uh, Reynolds sort of came up with this initially. Um, 
Ian Cousins was one of the people who kind of uh, developed this modeling framework a lot more, especially in the context of biology. Um, and in these well-studied models, um, uh, these Boyd's models, individuals have if if there have these zones of behavior, so uh, they will be they will avoid other individuals that are very very close to them. Um, they will be attracted to individuals who are much further apart from them, um, and then in individuals that are at some middling distance, uh, they will kind of tend to align with. Um, so that's sort of the basics of, of some of the earliest versions of these models. Um, and so we we took that same basic model and and several other extensions um and added uh, a goal direction and a dead end obstacle so added a challenging obstacle that would re require re require them to move backwards um and so we the other stuff we added was just they're not going to collide with the obstacles so we extended the model to um include collision avoidance um but we did not add in any other specialized behaviors for dealing with obstacles we were planning on it um, but then what happened surprised us, so we ended up not. So, so the individuals don't have any any rules for wall following. Um, they don't have any, you know, any of the kind of, um, you know, I thought we were going to take what I learned about the ant strategy and maybe apply it here. Um, but, but this is not even that complex. So, no, no obstacle navigation behavior um, other than just don't run into the obstacle. Um, and we explored a large parameter space um, for for this model. We also explored different versions of this model that are not based on these zones. So there, are, uh, and the individual parameters are things like you know how big is your zone of avoidance versus your zone of alignment versus your zone of attraction, and how much um, are you kind of weighting uh, those those three different possible behaviors, um, and uh, how fast are you moving, how fast are you turning, how many are in the group, how many are informed about the direction of the goal, et cetera. Um, and what we found, which was surprising to us at the time anyway, was that flocking escapes, this is what we called them, um, emerge when you have high alignment, when the individuals are waiting, the aligning with others, just moving in the same direction of, of others, if individuals are waiting that behavior high, um, then, you know, they will they will escape. Um, I've been waiting for them to escape. And I forgot that that was the example when they don't escape. <laughs> so this. <laughs> So over here on the left, that's when they they have low alignment and on the right is high alignment. So um, and and one of the reasons this was surprising is that um, there has been research uh, in the maybe the last five to 10 years where showing that that um, alignment behavior is not itself necessary for the kinds of um, movement to emerge in the absence of obstacles. So, so when you when you do simulations, you don't necessarily and you do simulations in the absence of obstacles. You're looking for behavior that is qualitatively similar to what these swarms do in nature. You don't need the alignment to get there. Um, but we found that with the alignment in in these simple models, um, these these individuals are just like spontaneously escaping. Um, okay, so a few more things about this. We we explored this in a lot of detail. Um, so solitary agents never escape, um, except that they do if they have an extremely low turn rate, a turn rate where they can't, you know, they'll hit the obstacle and they can't just turn around and go backwards. They're kind of forced, they're forced to wall follow because they can't turn fast enough. That's the only situation where solitary agents were able to escape. Um, and that's why we started calling it a flocking escape. Um, so let's look a little more carefully at Ellen? Uh, yes. Sorry. Can I ask you something? So is this a like kind of a mathematical or physical uh, consequence of the fact that if if they are aligned, they can um you know walk longer distances without you know random fluctuation or sure. random walk. So your radius is increased. Yeah, yeah. You I mean that's the punchline. Yeah, I, we we did get a mechanism and that's that's pretty much it. Um so yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I could just say let's say end of talk now, but no, I mean, there, there's perhaps some more interesting stuff, but absolutely. Yeah, you you uh, yeah, you you have higher directional persistence. You're more likely to move in the same direction for longer. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so we see that really quickly. So, um, you know, we looked at a wide range of values for alignment weight. So on the left here, it's showing just the proportion of simulations that had flocking escapes. Um, and you very quickly go from no flocking escapes to you're always doing flocking escapes. 
Um, and then this over here on the right is showing you how long it takes to get to the goal. So um, if you get to the goal at all. So uh, in many of the cases with low alignment weight, they never reached the goal, right? But if they did reach the goal, um, you know, as their align weight increased, they got to the goal faster and faster um, until the fact that um, they had that high directional persistence meant that even once they escaped the obstacle, they were taking really circuitous routes back. They were sort of like took them a long time to arc back to the um, to the goal. So so there is such there's certainly quickly such a thing as too high an alignment weight when it comes to um, just getting to the goal faster. Um, uh, uh, can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so how many of these agents uh, know what the dire target direction is? Yeah. So is in, the, in, in the results I'm showing you right now, it's 100% of them. Um, as I'll show you later on, um, that is, so if you have many fewer that know it, that that does affect things for sure. Um, so I'll I'll show you that in a minute, um, in, a, in, in a small way. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but right now, 100% no. Um, and so what we found is across the full parameter space, um, in general, this high alignment weight was necessary and sufficient for flocking escapes. So we played with a lot of parameters, as you saw, or I, I, you didn't see, but as I mentioned, um, and pretty much regardless of the parameter um, parameters of a particular simulation, if it had high alignment, they succeeded. If it didn't, they failed. Um, there are exceptions where it was either not necessary or not sufficient. Um, so, but just to kind of show you what this looks like. Um, so every panel here is a different parameter that we varied. And the um, orange dots are uh, the average of a bunch of simulations in terms of proportion of scape. Um, where they had high alignment. The green is that same parameter set, but with low alignment. Um, and you can see in general, uh, you know, when they had low alignment, they didn't succeed. When they had high alignment, they did. Um, and yes, there are exceptions. Um, and I'll go into some of the exceptions in a bit more detail. Happy to talk about the others as well. Um, so here's, you know, some more parameters. Um, and yes, fraction informed. So if if instead of having everybody informed, it's a lot less informed, you can um, you can see some um, escape from those obstacles even without high alignment. So we'll talk more about that. Um, when uh, the other one I wanted to point out here, so these are these are the cases when um, high alignment weight is not necessary. That's what I'm focusing on here. Um, uh, low, really, really low turn rate. You can also get some escape without um, without alignment. Um, I'm not going to focus on the cases where um, high alignment is not sufficient. In in most of these most of these parameters, there's some threshold um, above which you see the expected pattern of of high high escape with high alignment. Um, all right. So we wanted to know is um, I'll, I'll talk more in a moment about about the sort of low fraction formed and low turn rate. Um, but I wanted to kind of pause and uh, and and talk about um, what we did to to think about whether this flocking escape is just an artifact of the way we coded the model. Um, so or the way we implemented the model, or or maybe it happens with this zonal model where you have the discrete radii of different behaviors um but but that's not very realistic for real animals we don't think so maybe it it fails under more realistic situations so we um we like i said we built initially built the model with that zonal um zonal behavior um we also tested this with continuous zone boundaries where um the uh the different weights for avoidance alignment and attraction um are not there aren't these discrete boundaries where you just have you're 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 changing instead of changing your behavior and only doing one thing at a time you're um weighting the three possible behaviors depending on the distance to the um to the other individuals um and so yeah i'm not, not don't worry too much about understanding the precise details of this uh of this but um the point still held that even with a very very different way of implementing the same model um, that was based on some work by Daniel, Daniel Colovi um, on, on real fish, 
Um, so even in that scenario, we have um, low alignment weight, no escape, high alignment weight, you still see this escape. We also looked at a model um, with burst and coast movement instead of continuous a continuous velocity. So um, this is also more realistic for many fish species that, uh, that move in short bursts. Um, we found the same general pattern with escaping with high alignment, not escaping with low alignment. We wondered whether um, there was something about the shape of our obstacle that was maybe um, increasing the likelihood of having this behavior because it's curved. Maybe they're kind of reflecting off it in a funny way. So we looked at different shapes of obstacles um, as well, and we uh, were not we were not able to kind of prevent our flocking escapes from happening. So um, again, with high alignment, we saw flocking escapes basically all the time, and again with low alignment, we we did not see a lot of flocking escapes. Ellen, yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, I don't completely understand how your model um, translate to to the actual experiment because um, the ants are connected through this um, um, tuna that they're holding on, so they're absolutely aligned, right? It's not like they're individual ants moving around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we didn't want to. We were not trying to connect directly to that experiment at all. We said, okay, we learned some stuff. It was inspired by that, but actually. You know a totally separate thing we uh we looked at that i you know did the, did that project with the ants got me really interested in obstacle navigation and initially the plan was to say okay what do those rules that the ants were following or might have been following what do those mean when you're not tethered um but because we saw this flocking escape without even having to add any obstacle navigation rules we got really interested in that um, so, but, but the whole point indeed was to look at groups where there is no tether now. So, so we're, yeah, so you're right. There's no connection. I mean, there's a historical connection, um, and it's the same, a similar thing, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that was sort of providing context. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Great. So, um, okay. So point being, we just, we kind of, we tried to break this, um, and, and, we're, how, we're not able to uh, with with the specific ways that we tried to. Um, so I want to kind of recap um, what we found about flocking escapes in terms of describing them before looking a bit more at mechanism. Um, so the, these flocking escapes, as we called them, they happen without any specialized rules for navigation. Um, they are nearly ubiquitous when you do have high alignment weight. Um, the the cases where you don't need high alignment weight to get them are when you have uh, a low proportion of the individuals being informed about the goal and a low turn rate um and they never happen with solitary agents so uh um, again except the unless if the solitary agents have extremely low turn rate so the social aspect is key um, and we did explore the mechanism. Some of you have already asked questions. You're already thinking about the mechanism. This is obviously a great group to talk about this kind of thing with. Um, and uh, if if you're if you think you might have some intuition about the mechanism, you are probably right. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah. So once again, we have three parameters that enable escapes: high alignment, low fraction informed, low turn rate. And I just thought I'd show you a bit, a few more examples of what this behavior looks like with each of these. So that was a case of high alignment. This is a, a different case of high alignment. Um, they don't always move completely together as one group. They do sometimes split, um, but the high alignment, they always get there. Um, when you have fewer individuals informed, so in this case, the, um, the individuals that are in red are informed about the goal, um, you're also able to get this escape. Um, and then this is what it looks like when it's low turn rate. They're um, a little less aligned right they don't have high alignment here um but they're still able to escape all right so we um and i'm sorry i don't remember who who it was that mentioned this but um we um as as someone mentioned turn radius is something we got really interested in um turn so sort of how how their directional persistence and another way of thinking about that is how tightly are they able to turn? Um, so we, you know, implemented an individual, one of our model parameters was individual turn rate, um, the maximum rate that individuals could turn at. But what's the actual turn radius that you get when you have this group of agents that that have the behavioral rules that they have? So we measured that by um, doing separate simulations without any, um, without any goal without any obstacle and where their there were their goal was really just to turn as tightly as they could while following their rules and we measured their um turn radius um and so here 
Um, this panel shows you the turn radius as a function of each of those three parameters that we saw affect flocking escapes. So, um, so on the bottom here, this is turn radius as a function of a line weight. And you can see that, you know, as we expected, um, the groups with a higher alignment weight have a higher turn radius. Um, and likewise, turn radius is also strongly uh, affected by the turn rate. That's pretty intuitive and the fraction formed. So um, uh, in both of those cases, the higher that parameter is, the lower the turn radius. Um, so um, if you you can think about for fraction formed, which is perhaps the less intuitive of, of the two, um, you can think about that like if, if fewer individuals are informed about the direction of the goal, um, then collectively they're kind of weighting that lower. They're perhaps um, their, their collective behavior would be you know, caring a little bit less about getting to the goal um, or would have that effect. And so uh, so then their kind of relative weight of how how much they want to align arguably would be higher if you if you're just thinking about relative weights. Um, but either way, we have now we have this information about how turn radius is affected by each of these parameters. So here in this last graph on the right, um, I'm showing you turn radius as a function or sorry, proportion of flocking escapes um versus turn radius so uh for the for the three different parameters um the what was the x the sorry the y axis here in this middle panel now has become the x axis here and the the point of this is just to show you that indeed you know regardless of what parameter it is that's leading to a higher turn radius un unexpectedly with high turn radius you're more likely to get um to get flocking escapes but also the shapes of these curves you know we we didn't have there's not a lot of data here we didn't have a lot of we didn't test a ton of different levels but these look relatively similar they're they're not um they're not wholly different so i'm um, gonna try to just wrap up here um so overall we found that low effective turning rate is is leading to these flocking escapes um so that happens with high alignment because agents are prioritizing pointing in the same direction as their neighbors it happens with low fraction formed because low effective turn rate um it, it, sorry it happens with low fraction form because the drive to turn back towards the goal is lower um and it happens with low turn rate because it's low turn rate um and and the last thing i want to say about this project is that whether you're able so so having this low turn rate is is helpful potentially in the context of obstacles but whether you're doing that through alignment versus having a low fraction formed versus having a low um turn rate in the first place individual turn rate matters with respect to the larger context so um having the groups that had a low fraction formed those groups did escape but they took a lot longer to reach the goal overall than the groups that that escaped because they had high alignment um and low turn rate also in low individual turn rate also led to longer total navigation times and if we think about um downsides to having a low turn rate or a low fraction of formed you know negative possible consequences of that outside of the context of obstacle navigation just if you're like a school of fish in the wild um it makes sense that you know you you would want to be able to be individually agile and turn on a dime to escape a predator predator let's say or you would want to know where your goal is we can imagine pretty pretty intuitive downsides to those whereas you know there are also there's a downside to having a really high alignment weight um in the sense it takes you a bit longer to get to the goal um but uh there's less obvious, I would argue, less obvious downside to that in the context of, um, you know, other behaviors. Um, so we think that this really high alignment weight could potentially be a sweet spot where you, you, um, in the context of obstacle navigation, it allows you to navigate around those obstacles, but perhaps when you're avoiding a predator, you're still able to do that um, with some agility. Um, yeah, so with high alignment weight, groups can rapidly escape the obstacle still pretty quickly reach the goal um, and maintains the individual's ability to turn quickly and be informed. Um, all right, just to wrap, oh yeah, sorry. So flocking escapes emerge with high alignment weight. It's necessary and sufficient with few exceptions um, and regardless of our model implementation. So we do think it's possible that this is something that really happens for some species. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of, we think it allows you to get some 
quote unquote free obstacle navigation capabilities without sacrificing agility or speed. Um, I'll move on to kind of an overall recap. Uh, I think there's something, you know, it makes sense. This is obstacle navigation in two really different contexts. In the case of um, cooperative transport in ants, um, we are finding that they prioritize coordination over efficiency. So they are really good at maintaining consensus. Um, and that I think is a really important aspect of their success of why that species is so good at this. Um, and in that case, they start with a simple strategy and they add complexity only if they need to. Um, whereas in the case of untethered groups um, doing a very similar behavior, um, similar obstacle navigation task, um, they, I, I would argue having high alignment weight is also prioritizing coordination over efficiency, prioritizing alignment in this case um, over efficiency of movement. Um, and in this case, we didn't find that they actually had to have that added complexity. So, you know, even without um, changing the behavior over the course of the simulation, over the course of the time that they were stuck in the obstacle, they did um, escape much of the time. Um, so that was all I wanted to mention. Lots of um, lots of great collaborators who were part of these projects, um, and also the um, uh, the the bridge project that I'm sorry I ended up just teasing you about and not talking about at all. Um, oh, I wanted to also give uh, another shout out to Albert Cow since he's local. If you're curious about um, chatting with anyone else about collective behavior, he's done some really interesting stuff um, on that front. So yeah, happy to take any more questions.